So, hi everybody, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, currently, I'm a junior researcher in uh, Professor Adrian Silva Group at the University of Porto. Uh, this lecture will be focused on the synthesis and modification of carbon-based materials for environmental applications. I will skip the characterization techniques since that will be the topic of uh, Dr. Konshi Anya lecture later on in the morning, just before lunch. So, uh, why carbon materials? Carbon materials possess uh, useful properties for several environmental applications, such as the stability in acidic or basic media, the structural, structural stability in a relatively wide range of temperature, uh, the possibility to recover expensive metals easily if uh, carbon materials are to be used as supports, but the main feature is the possibility to control, up to some extent, the porosity and the surface chemistry of the materials, the carbon materials. So, this is a typical representation of uh, activated carbon structure. Uh, in this case, the random bonding of the carbon uh, layers creates space, empty space, uh, which are called porosity. Mainly uh, micropores and mesopores. Uh, even in this very disordered structure, uh, okay, sorry, this porosity is responsible for the high specific surface area these materials usually possess, and uh, also, that makes these materials uh, very good for adsorption or as support for metal catalysts. So, as I was saying, even in these very disordered materials, one can find small fragments of graphene sheets. Graphene sheets, which are the base building block, the building block, the base material for all the graphitic crystalline materials such as graphite, carbon nanotubes, or fullerenes. These uh, graphitic materials possess very high conductivity, which renders them very good for catalysis or also as support for metal catalysts. Uh, several materials uh, fall in between these two opposites, and in this uh, presentation I will talk about the synthesis, modification and application of activated carbons, carbon gels, graphene-based materials, but also hybrid magnetic carbon nanocomposites, which was actually the topic of my PhD. So, regarding the synthesis techniques, the most commonly used is pyrolysis. In this case, a carbon precursor, such as wooded, wood-based materials or carbon-rich residues, but also polymers, gels, or resins produced by other techniques are uh, treated under control atmosphere and subjected to heat. The atmosphere can be either um, inert or oxidative, depending on the goal of the treatment. Another technique is chemical vapor deposition. In this case, the carbon precursor is a hydrocarbon gas and a transition metal catalyst is used. If a flat surface of metal is used, you will obtain a graphene sheet. Something like this. <laughs> uh, whereas, if the metal particle is used, you will promote the growth of carbon nanotubes. So, st starting with activated carbon. There are two main routes for the preparation of activated carbon. The chemical activation or the physical activation. In the chemical activation, uh, an activated agent is added to the carbon precursor and then carbonization and activation occurs simultaneously, usually in an oven like this one. In physical activation, the carbonization occurs first, followed by activation. 
in either case, the a porous network of highly disordered graphitic material is obtained. And the material is usually shaped as granules after these steps. Uh, these materials are com very commonly used as supports for uh, metal catalysts, namely iron, which is the example I will show you. In this case, the activated carbon granules uh, should be ground in order to obtain a narrow particle size range. And then the most commonly used technique for impregnation is incipient wetness impregnation. To do it, uh, one should perform first a test. For that purpose, you should add a known amount of water, uh, uh, sorry, you should add uh, water dropwise to a known amount of activated carbon, and you keep adding it. And once you see that uh, that extra drop of water is no longer absorbed, you stop adding water, and that is the pore volume. Afterwards, you'll prepare an aqueous solution with that volume, with the same volume you previously determined. In this case, the metal precursor I used was iron three, and you add it to a fresh sample of the carbon, which is then dried and calcined in order to promote the growth of the metal, the growth and the attachment of the metal crystals. The final step is very important, I like to stress that, is the washing step. And it's, it is required to remove the not so well attached metal species. The resulting catalyst was employed in catalytic wet peroxide oxidation, which briefly is an advanced oxidation process, which employs hydrogen peroxide as oxidation source and a suitable heterogeneous catalyst to promote its decomposition via hydroxyl radical formation. As expected, the material was very active for this process, if you see the model pollutant removal as a function of time. However, a very large amounts of iron were leached into the treated water. This is uh, indeed the most common drawback of this kind of catalyst. Uh, activated carbons can also be prepared from residues. In this case, we have prepared uh, glycerol-based carbon materials by partial carbonization of glycerol in the presence of sulfuric acid. Once again, the drying step is crucial to remove unreacted precursors in this case. The resulting material is then dried, ground, and thermally annealed, resulting in this uh, carbon material, which I named glycerol-based carbon material, which is a non-porous material. You cannot see pores in here. This material was then thermally activated under air atmosphere at different temperatures, leading to a significant increase of porosity. So, as we can see here, the specific surface area of the material of ma the materials increase as the activation temperature increases. At, while at the same time, the amount of oxygen uh, containing functionalities at the surface of the carbon material also increases as suggested by this decrease of the pH at the point of zero charge. Uh, so. this mat I won't show you, I won't go into too much detail, but this material were active for catalytic wet peroxide oxidation as well. Another group of materials are carbon gels. These are very important materials, I think. Um, activated carbons are mainly microporous materials, while uh, carbon gels are mesoporous. This is an important um, characteristic for catalysis, mainly for the reactant diffusion, reactant and products and everything. Okay, carbon gels are, can be prepared by polycondensation of resorcinol and formaldehyde. Uh, uh, after the gelation step, this, the resulting solid can be shaped as desired. Okay. 
then the drying step. In this case, the drying step will actually dictate the, the kind of carbon gel that will be obtained at the end of the treatment. For instance, if supercritical drying is uh, used, you will obtain carbon aerogel. If conventional drying is employed, you will obtain carbon xerogels. And if freeze drying is used, you will obtain carbon cryogels. <coughs> Sorry. In this example, I've used conventional drying. And then, after thermal annealing, we have obtained a carbon xerogel. Uh, another important feature of carbon gels, uh, of carbon gels is the sensibility of the textural properties of the resulting materials to the pH of the gelation step. It is possible to somehow control the porosity of the resulting material just by changing this pH. It has been shown that for pH in the range of 5.5 up to 6.5, uh, mesoporous materials with larger average pore size are obtained as the pH decreases. So, but how can the performance of carbon xerogels in environmental catalytic applications be enhanced? One strategy is to add metal precursors in the gelation step. In this case, we employ the bimetallic system with iron and cobalt, a magnetic carbon xerogel being obtained. This material revealed very high, very good performance, both in catalytic weight peroxide oxidation and activated persulfate oxidation. So let's go to the graphene-based materials. As I mentioned earlier, uh, graphene sheets can be obtained by chemical vapor deposition. In this case, the graphene sheets present the highest quality and the highest conductivity, uh, making them very good for electronic applications. However, uh, this technique does not allow the production of graphene sheets in large amounts, and the resulting material does not contain oxygen-containing functionalities. An alternative is the chemical oxidation procedure. In this case, uh, graphite, is subjected to a strong chemical oxidation, leading to the formation of graphite oxide. Graphite oxide can then be uh, physically exfoliated, and after the separation of the unexfoliated uh, fraction, you will obtain graphene oxide. Graphene oxide is a very hydrophilic material due to the presence of large amounts of oxygen containing groups. Graphene oxide can then be reduced using uh, very different agents, such as vitamin C or glucose, which we tried as an alternative to conventional hydrazine. And you will obtain the so-called reduced graphene oxide, which is this um, fluffy black material. Okay, that being said, I strongly recommend you to read this carbon editorial, uh, carbon journal editorial uh, on the recommended nomenclature for graphene based materials. For instance, the name reduced graphene oxide is used in order to distinguish the route used for the synthesis of this material. Okay, so. The material obtained in this way, the quality of the material is not so good as in chemical vapor deposition. However, large-scale production is feasible. Although the material uh, presents lower conductivity, it has some defects and some oxygen-containing functionalities, since the re reduction is never uh, complete. I would like to stress the presence of structural defects and oxygen-containing functionalities. At the micro scale, we usually perceive structural defects as something bad. However, uh, at the nano scale, several studies have been showing 
that defects, the presence of structural defects is actually good for catalysis. That was the case of one of our studies on catalytic wet peroxide oxidation. Uh, in this case, we have found that structural defects cause the confinement of electron-rich regions, which act as the active sites for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide via hydroxyl radical formation and the subsequent pollutant degradation. On the other hand, in the study of our group, uh, we have found that the presence of oxygen-containing functionalities actually mediates the attachment of titanium dioxide nanoparticles and thus enhance the performance of these composites in photocatalysis. So, carbon nanotubes. There are several different techniques to produce carbon nanotubes. Uh, one of them is chemical vapor deposition. I won't go into too much detail on this technique because we, we don't uh, use it in our lab. What we do is the surface functionalization and heteroatom doping both of both single-walled and multi-walled carbon nanotubes. As a result, these materials have been shown as efficient in very different um, AO AOPs, such as catalytic wet oxidation, catalytic wet peroxide oxidation, photocatalysis, and membrane distillation. Uh, one of the techniques used to control the surface chemistry of the carbon nanotubes is the hydrothermal oxidation with nitric acid. Uh, by using uh, low concentrated acid solutions, it is possible to control both the type and the amount of oxygen-containing functionalities added to the carbon structure uh, with no significant impact on the carbon nanotubes structure. So finally, I will show you a way to prepare um, hybrid magnetic carbon nanocomposites in which the magnetic phase is protected against the, um, the external environment by a graphitic shell. So first, <laughs> I synthesized magnetite nanoparticles by co-precipitation. And then the composites were obtained by hierarchical co-assembly of magnetite nanoparticles and carbon precursors. So why hierarchical co-assembly? Because the assembly of the magnetite nanoparticles is faster than that of the carbon precursors. So it will occur first, and then the carbon precursor layer will form afterwards. After thermal annealing, a clearly distinguishable uh, core shell structure was obtained. You can see here the quality of the image is not so good, but you can see the magnetic core and the carbon shell around it. Other uh, magnetic nanoparticles, such as cobalt ferrite, were also uh, used to prepare these kind of materials. So, these were very high performance catalysts for different environmental applications. In the case of catalytic wet peroxide oxidation, we showed that the performance of magnetite nanoparticles is actually enhanced by the presence of the carbon phase. This was uh, ascribed to the presence of the carbon shell, which increased the adsorptive interactions between the pollutant pollutant molecules and the surface of the catalyst, thus uh, improving the efficiency of hydrogen peroxide consumption. Uh, these materials were also... Uh, okay, the, the, another important feature of these materials was the leaching of iron species. We showed that uh, the leaching of iron species is strongly contained by the carbonaceous shell. So these materials were also very active for persulfate oxidation. I won't 
show you the results because it doesn't matter. What I really want to show you is our latest finding. Basically, we, we, we found that the, the ferromagnetic core of these hybrid materials is able to uh, convert the magnetic energy into thermal energy, thus uh, increasing the temperature of the surface uh, of the catalyst and enhancing the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide via hydroxyl radical formation and the subsequent degradation of the pollutant molecules. This process was coined as magnetically activated catalytic wet peroxide oxidation. So, as final remarks, I would like to say that uh, several research advances have been reached as a consequence of the development of new catalysts. And that's the reason why material science is an important tool for environmental catalytic applications such as uh, photocatalysis, catalytic wet peroxide oxidation, catalytic wet oxidation, persulfate oxidation, or even electro-oxidation, among others. And finally, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to introduce our team, in particular those current, uh, with who I currently work with, and our members or future members of this school such as Rita, Marta, Nunu, Anna, Marta, and what Mariana, is the, What and is the end of the group? I, and I, I do not see the end of... Ah, okay. Of course, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> our supervisor, Adrian yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again.